I want to take a moment to introduce our next, our next guest, who I am so happy to be able to call Dr. Ryan Lowry. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oof, that's right. Thank you. Thanks, Bri. Guys, it's an absolute honor to be here. I absolutely love coming to these events because you see a lot of these people on like social media and you see all these, this community really building and it's amazing to kind of like get together and meet in person. So that's incredible. Today we're gonna to be talking about optimizing body composition and human performance through a well-formulated ketogenic lifestyle. And when we're talking human performance, it's not what a lot of you probably think it is uh, with purely athletes. So for me, this journey started September 10th, 2002. I was playing a football game on a Friday night, and I was always, I always loved seeing my parents up in, the, up in the audience, and I would look up, and all of a sudden I didn't see my mom there, and I was like, where'd she go? Like she was always at every single one of my games. And I saw her, and after the game, my dad picked us up. We had just won like a huge football game, and my dad's like, we got to drive down the shore. And I'm like, what happened? I'm from New Jersey, so we say drive down the shore. Um, I said, what happened? I said, what happened? He goes, Grandma's in the hospital, like, and it's not looking good. I'm like, I just saw her last weekend. What happened? And by the time we had gotten to the hospital, she had already passed away. Um, and that was my grandma with my cousin. And it didn't make sense to me. It was something that I could not wrap my mind around for the longest time. And it just ate at me over and over and over again. And I've studied her autopsy report. And this is literally what it says in it. An obese woman in moderate to severe respiratory distress, lethargic. And that just ate at me because that didn't define the woman that she was. And so for me, that really started this health journey of how can I help other people not go through that pain and that, that suffering because of certain advice that might have not been given to her at certain points. And that's what I really wanted to do. So I, I come up with this concept. I said, listen, there's a lot of people who want to change things in the world. You could literally sit on the sideline and you can complain about it or you could actually do something about it. And so that's kind of the debate that I played over my head. Which route do we take? And so there's like the traditional system of like, hey, let's go this route. Let's let's do this. And I was going to go into academics and teach like a nine to five. And that's great. Like you can, you can do a lot of research there, but we kind of wanted to take a different route. And we said, you know what, there's innovative and alternative solutions. And if I want to figure out a way to help move that process forward, we need to be a part of that change. And so we created something called the Applied Science and Performance Institute, which you'll see here in a little bit. And so the journey after that began, I went to University of Tampa uh, to play baseball. And I was fortunate, we won a national championship uh, my junior year. And we soon realized that we had this passion for science. And when I say we, this is uh, my business partner, Dr. Jacob Wilson. Uh, they call him the muscle PhD. And he, we basically had this mission of how do we really extend beyond athletic performance? And the reason is, Jacob and I have a very close relationship. I call his, his parents mom and dad. He calls my parents mom and dad. And for me, when you look at like why you're trying to do something in life, I always go back to like, what's your why? And for me, my why is very clear. And for me, it's my mom, right? She's like the world to me. And I would do anything for her. And she has several health complications. Uh, actually got diagnosed with Crohn's about over a decade ago. And my goal is to figure out a way to make her as happy as humanly possible and make her not suffer because I, I grew up where we had to pull over and go to a gas station every 10 minutes because her stomach was upset. And I grew up watching her like nibble at food when I'm over there like pounding it, not understanding the, the complications and challenges she's facing. And so we soon realized that this athletic realm that we were so involved in extended far beyond sport and really wanted to effectively help change individuals like my mom. So since then, we've published and presented all over the world. Uh, collectively, I think Jacob and I have over 300 papers, abstracts, and book chapters. We published a book uh, called The Ketogenic Bible um, and kind of really set out on this mission to help educate the masses. And really, I was talking earlier, 
about what our mission is. I was talking to Victoria over at Keto Pet, and I said, our goal is really to take what was once accessible to the 1% and make it accessible to the 99%, right? You have these scientists that are doing absolutely incredible work, amazing work, and it sits on the shelf and we don't find out about it 20 years later. Like, that's not acceptable to me. Like, if, if I'm studying something in the lab and it, and it comes out the way that we're looking for, I want to make sure people hear about it the next day. And so we don't have 10 years. We don't have that time to do that. So we wanted to figure out a way to do that. So we created what's called the Applied Science and Performance Institute. And so I'll show you a little, I'll give you a little sneak peek here of what the ASPE really is. Thank you. So that's really always been a vision for us of how do we create something that extends beyond the four walls and a ceiling that you traditionally see in academics and be able to help people on a global scale. So one of the questions we, we figure we ask when you have this ketogenic conversation, you've heard some incredible talks today, is how did we get here? right? You look at what's happening in today's society. This, this, I, it's painful for me to put this into presentations of how much the obesity rate has grown. And I was listening to my good friend uh, Sean Wells upstairs. The scary part about this isn't even the fact that the obesity rate has grown. It's the fact that the obesity rate in children has grown to a point where it's like uncontrollable at this point. Like we have to, do, we have to implement something yesterday. What typically was referred to as adult onset diabetes, we can no longer call that anymore because children are getting it and they're getting it at a rapid rate. So how did we go from the point of like this, that whole primal instinct, to this, right? And in essence, that's what it is. Kids are, they're begging for things like this. And everyone knows, we can go into the whole Ansel Key. Everyone here is very familiar with Ansel Keys and the the craziness that happened in the 1950s that we're still recovering from to this day, but clearly we're making strides towards better. And this is one of my favorite things. This is great, right? Like, uh, born in 1939, it died in 2015. Um, and that's a, I think it's good that we're progressing, and conferences like this help move that conversation forward. So the question, the first question that we're going to tackle today is, is it possible to gain muscle on a ketogenic diet? And how did we get to this point is one of our good friends, Dr. Jeff Volick, was giving a talk at a, at a conference, and he, and he was giving an amazing talk on endurance athletes. And it makes sense, right? You hit the wall typically when you're an endurance athlete. If you can run on your own body fat, you can potentially extend that. And he's shown that multiple times. He's even shown, in fact, in his recent FASTER study that uh, endurance athletes have the same amount of glycogen, which is our stored form of carbohydrates, as individuals who are eating a carbohydrate-rich diet. Like, our bodies are pretty good at adapting. But at the end of his presentation, someone stood up and said, but Dr. Volick, what research has been done in resistance-trained athletes? And he said, quite honestly, there isn't any. 
So Jacob and I looked at each other and we're like, man, we got a lot of work to do. And this was back in 2010. So we've been doing research on these topics ever since and really trying to find out new boundaries of where we can really aid in, in overall human performance and health. Clearly it's possible, right? You look at the, these guys, like Luis from Keto Gains is a great guy. Um, we've known, like it's been shown. Like we've seen it anecdotally. We see it, everyone sees Keto Savage, right? He's got a great booth over here. Like we see this happening. But the question is, people are still like, no, if I go on a ketogenic diet, I'm just going to melt away. All the muscles are just going to go, Right? So what did we do? We took a group of 25 resistance trained subjects, put them on a well-formulated ketogenic diet versus kept the others on a Western diet. We adapted them for two weeks and trained them for eight. Why do we adapt them? Well, most studies that typically are done that show that ketogenic diets aren't beneficial for performance never allow these individuals to adapt. So we made sure they were working with a dietitian in order to make that happen. And one of the strongest points about our study was we matched for protein. So there's been studies done on athletes, but they typically go, oh, well, that thing's higher in protein, so that's why. And I said, no, let's match for that and see what happens. What you're seeing here is blood ketone levels. And those blood ketone levels show you the difference over the, over the weeks of the ketogenic dieting group versus the Western diet, clearly an elevation in ketone levels. This is fat mass levels at baseline and post. The ketogenic dieting group lost significantly more fat mass than the Western diet after 10 weeks and were able to gain just as much muscle mass, right? We showed this. We, we showed this out. Got a lot of heat for it after it was published. Of course, that's impossible. I'm like, okay. We've shown it. We've demonstrated it. Show the DEXA scans over and over again. It's possible. And since then, we've... Uh, well, this is one of the things that we looked at as well. Here's all of the different areas. You look at no significant differences in strength. People go, oh, your strength's going to go down. No differences in strength. We actually saw, which was quite interesting, a significant increase uh, in testosterone levels, and they were all males in this study. Um, after the study, it makes logical sense, right? They're eating a lot more fat. Cholesterol is a precursor for synthesis of testosterone. We saw that go up, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and no significant changes in cholesterol triglycerides. That's a huge topic, and Dave gave a great presentation earlier uh, on the whole cholesterol thing as well. So building off of that, some of our friends and colleagues said, all right, well, let's take this into CrossFit athletes. So Rachel Gregory uh, did a study, and she found the same thing over six weeks, right? They were able to uh, lose a significant amount of body fat and maintain their lean mass and performance. Another study showing it. We teamed up with a group at Auburn University, and that's what this, this was actually a headliner in the journal, showing after three months, CrossFit training athletes were able to improve their body composition and maintain their performance. Like, it's being shown over and over again. So I think we're past the time of people going, that's impossible. Multiple labs are now showing it. And this even extends to power lifters, right? People that you, you feel like, oh, those guys got to have carbohydrates. This study was done out of, uh, in New Zealand, and they found no significant differences in strength, right? It's, it's crazy. So how is this possible, right? This is what you, you say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to eat like a low-carbohydrate, higher-fat ketogenic diet. People go, oh, is this going to be you, right? Everyone's seen SpongeBob struggle with that. When in actuality, you're more like this guy. Uh, you're more like this guy. And I saw him to, like, I saw this picture, and then I saw him today, and he's more like this. And I'm like, Danny, man, what's going on? I was like, you, people are gonna, people are gonna be like, oh, it's, it's impossible to gain. I'm like, they just gotta look at this guy. Like, he's, he's a classic example of how it is possible to gain. But there's two aspects when it comes to gaining muscle, right? There's the synthesis part, or the building of muscle, and then there's the breakdown part. Both are very important for net accretion of muscle mass. We actually did a study where we gave animals ketones and we looked at what something called muscle protein synthesis, which is the trigger basically for muscle growth. And we found that animals that had the highest amount of ketones actually triggered muscle protein synthesis, which is what you typically see with like protein or amino acids. We saw that with ketones themselves. So ketones themselves may be anabolic. On the counter side to that, you look at muscle protein breakdown, there's data 
showing that ketones prevent the breakdown of a very important amino acid called leucine. Who's heard of leucine before? Good, a lot of you. So leucine is the primary amino acid that's responsible for muscle growth. Le uh, ketones help prevent that from being broken down, right? That's really interesting. I think there's some studies that we plan on doing in the future. I think the threshold needed to achieve what, it's basically like a light switch, turning on the muscle growth process. I think the threshold needed in someone who's in a state of ketosis is a lot less than someone who's on a carbohydrate-rich diet. Uh, we still have to test that out, but that's, that's one of my theories. And then we looked at this. So everyone's concerned about gluconeogenesis, right? Converting amino acids over into, into carbohydrates so that we can utilize them. Yes, your body does go through a process known as gluconeogenesis when you're in a state of ketosis. However, your body's very smart and utilizes glucogenic amino acids, amino acids that are non-essential amino acids, and that's what we saw here. Amino acids like alanine get utilized probably to go over to that process and be utilized um, for glycogen and carbohydrates. However, important amino acids like branched chain amino acids and leucine aren't lower. They're not significantly lower on a ketogenic diet. So your body's smart. It does go through a process of gluconeogenesis. Granted, you can use things like glycerol and lactate, but you can use amino acids. Amino acids that are just not essential for muscle building and overall body composition. So the question that we then had is, what about cyclic ketogenic dieting, right? I saw Danny yesterday, and he was eating, and he was like eating a piece of cake, and I'm like, bro, what are you doing? What are you doing? And uh, he said, dude, don't judge me. It's cheat day. Um, no, I'm just kidding. He was crushing meat at a, at a barbecue place. Um, but this is, this is the concept of cyclical ketogenic dieting, right? Monday through Friday, this is one concept. Granted, there's, there's others. We wanted to study this one. So this is eat ketogenic Monday through Friday, carb up on the weekends, repeat the process, right? Is it, is it just as good as a ketogenic diet? Can you have your cake, regular cake, not keto cake, and eat it too? Here's what we found. You look at blood ketone levels. At the top is the individuals who are on a strict ketogenic diet. On the bottom, you're looking at cyclic ketogenic dieting. And here we're looking at days of the week. So think about this. These individuals are carving up on the weekend. They're not in ketosis on Monday, not in ketosis on Tuesday or Wednesday. Thursday, they're just starting to get in ketosis. Friday, they're in. Boom, they're back out on Saturday. Both groups lost the same amount of total mass. So on a scale, you'd be like, oh, this is a win for cyclic ketogenic dieting. I could just eat that keto thing Monday through Friday and then like have all the cake and cookies and sushi and all that stuff on the weekends, right? On, on a scale, that sounds like, like great. But weight's not the only thing we're looking at. We're looking at the composition of that weight. And here we found that the, ketogenic, the stricter ketogenic dieting group lost nearly all of what they lost was fat mass, whereas the cyclic ketogenic dieting group lost nearly a fraction of that. So what does that mean they lost? They lost, they lost muscle mass. And they were in a caloric deficit. These people were resistance training in a caloric deficit. So cyclic may not be the best option. It may not, this type of cyclic. Granted, there's targeted approaches. There's less intense cyclic. But this is something that we saw like, hey, it's not good to just eat keto Monday through Friday and then blow it out on the weekends. So the question becomes, is there something unique about being in a state of ketosis? And this is one of the most fascinating studies um, that came around. It's in the 1970s, and I still don't know why this gets brought up, because we get a lot of people that go, hey, calorie, it's just a calorie thing. Uh, keto's not better than Western diets when you match for calories and everything like that. I'm like, cool, check out Young 1973. Like Every time someone says that, I'm like, cool, check out this study. They literally match for calories. They match for protein intake. And this was the result. This is looking at weight loss as fat. 104 grams of carbs a day, 60 grams of carbs a day, and 30 grams of carbs per day. So what does that mean? And they were dieting, these individuals. What does that mean that they lost? That's the ones that weren't in ketosis. They weren't in ketosis. This was the actual group that was in the state of ketosis. So to say there's not a metabolic advantage, okay, one study. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. We all know the people who look at donuts, 
um, right? They, they look at it and they'll put on 10 pounds, right? We all know those types of people. We also know the other people that'll eat 10 donuts and wake up with veins in their abs the next day, right? They're, two, they're very different people. Well, one of the concepts around that is a concept known as feed efficiency. And that's weight gained over calories consumed. So what that means in essence is the lower the efficiency means you're less likely to store what you're eating as fat. So those people that look at donuts and gain 10 pounds have a very high efficiency. Their bodies are very efficient at storing calories. Whereas you look at the people that eat it, they're very low. They have very low efficiency. So we looked in an animal, mo we looked in an animal model. We looked at a ketogenic diet plus exogenous ketones and a Western diet versus exogenous ketones. And almost in a, a direct fashion, you kind of see the Western diet plus uh, the Western diet by itself, Western diet plus exogenous ketones, and the ketogenic diet plus exogenous ketones had the lowest efficiency. Ketogenic diet plus exogenous, and this was in an animal model, had the lowest efficiency out of any of them. So they were eating the same amount of calories, yet the amount of weight that they gained was a lot lower, right? Why is that the case? Well, here's one of our thoughts, is who's heard of brown fat? Brown fat, right? Great, very, very smart crew. Um, brown fat's thermogenically active, right? It's, it's very metabolically demanding uh, substrates. They're the powerhouse of our cells, right? Uh, you want a lot of mitochondria, and that's what brown fat have a lot of that mitochondria in them. And so we looked at brown adipose tissue uh, in some of these animals, and again, in a dose-dependent fashion, you look at the low-carb ketogenic diet plus ketones had a 41% increase in brown adipose tissue. So this whole calorie theory thing again, it's, it's, it keeps coming up, but it shows you that it may not be as simple as, hey, calorie in, calorie out kind of concept. There's, calories have different metabolic impacts, and how that plays out over long-term body composition seems to be different, even when matching for calories and protein. So I saw this article, and I won't get into it, uh, come up the other day, and a lot of people sh sent it over to me, uh, this popular magazine, said, oh, ketogenic diets shorten your telomeres and speed aging, right? So I was like, well, let's dig into this. You look at what causes aging. Well, one theory on aging is this programmed aging theory, where you have these genes, when you're young, they're turned on, and when you age, they kind of turn off, right? And so that speeds the aging process. Well, we wanted to look at this in animals. So if you're kind of queasy, I didn't really give you a warning about that, but you're stuck here anyway. Um, so the question becomes, what if you fed uh, diet, uh, animals a ketogenic diet their entire lives. So this is one of the things that kind of completely shifted my perspective when it comes to ketogenic dieting because a lot of people get caught up on like the aesthetics of it, right? Like I look a certain way, but we really don't get to look underneath the hood of what's going on internally. And so we were able, you're able to do that in animals. So we basically had these animals and you see here a western diet which looks rough around those organs. That's, that's adipose tissue. You see a ketogenic diet and you see a standard chow um, which is like a higher protein, low fat, low carb. The ketogenic diet looks like something that's like out of a textbook, right? And so we looked at this. We said, all right, let's look at lifespan. And when you look at lifespan, this is the lifespan of the ketogenic dieting group and the western dieting group. It was nearly double. We let them, we kind of fed them throughout their entire lives and let them live it out. So this concept is just crazy to me. If anything, I think it's the opposite. And there's a lot of signaling mechanisms that I think contribute to that, that we won't get into, but I think it's a really interesting concept. So the second part of this, we're gonna go into what's some new research underway? Uh, what's some new stuff that we're doing at our lab uh, to really answer some of these questions that you see up here? The first thing is people always talk about the adaptation period, right? Keto adaptation, it's, it's rough. We talk about uh, electrolyte supplementation and things like that. One of the things that we found is oftentimes when people embark on a ketogenic diet, they like take it easy, right? They start to feel like, oh man, like they're just starting out. They're like, I don't know, like I, I have a little bit of a headache. And they'll like take several days off at the gym or they won't move much because they kind of don't feel good. We're like, well, what if you did the opposite? What if you just like pushed through that and did like high intensity interval training, um, which is like all out as fast as you can kind of sprints. Uh, and we looked at this and we found that the individuals who did a ketogenic diet plus high intensity interval training adapted a lot faster. 
And it makes sense, right? They're depleting muscle glycogen, they're working out. And a lot of people don't understand that concept of, hey, move more during the adaptation period, don't try and move less. Uh, so that's one thing that uh, we're just finishing up to get ready to publish. The other aspect that we're kind of doing an enormous trial on uh, right now is Parkinson's. Uh, neurological conditions is so interesting in, in where we are for current states of treatment and where we need to be. Uh, so this is one of the devices that we utilize in our laboratory called a right eye. So you look at this and it can track eye movement. And from this we can depict a lot of different things. We can get a lot of quantitative data from this. So I'll show you an example of one subject that we had in. And for this, this is just giving him exogenous ketones, which is quite interesting um, compared to like, imagine if he was on a ketogenic diet plus exogenous ketones uh, or some other therapies that we're currently working on uh, with this study. But you look at baseline, right? Squiggly all over, his right eye and his left eye are shifted. Imagine living like that all day. That's what Parkinson's patients have to go through is like it's kind of like fuzzy all day, but these are micro things. You wouldn't be able to look in someone's eyes and see this. It's only detectable by some of these machines that we're utilizing to, to gather this data. Just 30 minutes after, this is kind of what happened, right? And it's a lot of it's, sim it's providing a substrate that their brains can effectively utilize, take up, and, and implement. And we see it for this. This is another good example. This is baseline, and this is 30 minutes post. This is vision transfer capacity. Again, clearly a sign of these individuals don't have an effective fuel source that they can take up and utilize, so why aren't we providing it? Ideally through dietary and nutritional means, but acutely we can provide it and then get them on a program to kind of do it. So this is a brand new study. So Jacob and I are fascinated uh, with the firefighters. His dad's a firefighter. Uh, and really want to help the firefighter community, but not only the firefighter community, but um, soldiers. And so one of the things that we first studies that we embarked on, we teamed up with a group uh, in Mississippi, and this was just seven days of supplementation with exogenous ketones, uh, and they, these guys carried around their packs and did a treadmill exercise protocol, 35 minutes at 60% VO2. We found that after seven days, it reduced cardiac work and enhanced focus actually during the physical challenge, right? It's very preliminary data, but for firefighters whose lives are on the line, that could be cool. Imagine if they were on a ketogenic diet, a well-formulated ketogenic diet, and they're going into battle to handle a lot of these situations in a better state. Uh, one of the commitments that Jacob and I made when we got asked to write this book, we got asked to write the ketogenic Bible, and one of the commitments we said was, listen, this thing's going to be a huge undertaking, but everything that we make from this book, we want to put back to further ketogenic education and research. So one of the studies that we just funded um, that's getting underway in Georgia is actually looking at uh, a ketogenic diet with or without exogenous ketones in soldiers uh, with PTSD. So that's an area that we're actively looking into and want to help further that and get a better understanding. So that's underway. So next year at uh, KetoCon, we'll hopefully be talking a lot about that data. Ketones and Crohn's. So this was like a ketogenic lifestyle. So this was an, an instance, this was a case study, basically had an individual implement daily walking, maybe 10 minutes per day, nothing radical, didn't go on a ketogenic diet, uh, slightly lowered carbohydrate intake, supplemented with exogenous ketones twice per day. Um, and what we looked at was a marker of inflammation, C-reactive protein. And to give you guys an example of C-reactive protein, like the average range is like from zero to four, zero to five. Uh, this individual is at s over 60. Uh, so clearly a ton of inflammation going on. Uh, and after the three months, we saw that it was actually below the reference range. So Definitely an intervention happening, and then kind of got them to switch over to a ketogenic diet and still see these numbers and obviously all the benefits that come with a ketogenic diet. But one thing that is clear, and this is evident, and this is one of my favorite depictions that we kind of put into the book, is as we get older, our brains cannot effectively utilize glucose like when we were kids, right? It's been shown, documented over and over and over again. Right? You have these people who have 
pre-Alzheimer's, and they're showing signs of early stages of Alzheimer's. A lot of people, as they get older, you look, you look do scans and images of, of people's brains, their brains cannot take up and utilize glucose the same way. So why are we still pushing for them to try and take up and utilize that fuel source when they effectively can't? Yet, we have plenty of MCT transporters, right? That's the transporters that kind of allow ketones and to be taken up by the cell. Those are, those are still intact. Those are fine. Why aren't we providing them a fuel source that they can utilize? And one of the most frustrating areas that we're actively pushing towards is, I would say, overall contact sports. These are two individuals we work with, Randy Moss and Heath Evans, um, but several others were getting former NFL vets to come in, and you've seen the stories, right? You've all seen the story. You see that on Sundays, but you see the stories of like all of these brains coming back, and nearly 99% of them have CTE. Clearly, there's a problem, and a better helmet won't fix it. We're not fixing, we're, we're addressing the symptom, not the root cause of it, right? Let's get to the root cause. And clearly the root cause of it is these individuals who experience not just the big hit like you see there, but the micro trauma, the linemen over and over and over again who are getting small hits, their brains become temporarily insulin resistant. They're not able to utilize glucose, yet they go over to the sideline, slug down probably more carbohydrates than this entire room has had in the last week and, and in, in a game. And their brain can't effectively utilize it. And it's still so backwards, this thinking of, why don't we look at this? And there's, there's actually a lot of studies that are published on ketones and brain injury, and it's clearly an area we're passionate about and we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to those individuals on, on, a, on a level of some of the teams that we work with. We're able to get to them, but we need to, we need to get to a mass audience of people that are not only involved in the NFL, right? The NFL gets a lot of the publicity and press, but there's MMA, there's soccer, right? People don't think about soccer, but you look at head trauma and concussions in youth soccer, it's one of the most prevalent, uh, which is crazy from all the headers. So we need to be smarter about thinking about how we provide a better source of fuel for the brain, and that's one of the areas that we're diving into. One of the last case studies I want to talk to you about, who's heard of Tony Robbins? Okay, good, good, good guy. Um, Tony speaks all over the world. Uh, he's one of the best uh, coaches, just in general, and actually just an incredibly genuine guy. And so we work with Tony, uh, and so I'm going to show you a little bit of his data and we're implementing some of these strategies for him. And you wouldn't believe what a day in the life of like Tony Robbins is like from a, from just from like how much he expends from energy, but you'll see that. So we brought him into the lab, did a whole gamut of testing on him, went to an event, or actually going to an event next month with him to re-monitor him again, to see if the intervention we kind of placed him on had any impact. Uh, but here's something that's fascinating, you look at, most people, this is the average population, he was on the right eye. Kind of that data that I showed you earlier, he was on that thing, and this is his ability, right? His, his ability far exceeds the normal population. The guy could just go places mentally that 99% of the population can't go. But that includes physically, right? So to put it in perspective, we monitored him during a half day of one of his events. Just a half day, it wasn't even a full day. Half day of one of his events. And he expended 8,000 calories. Like, we literally hooked him up during this event, 8,000 calories during this event, and probably consumed maybe 400, right? Like, I, we, were, we work very closely with um, some of his training staff and, and nutritionists, and all they give him on days is coconut oil, which I'm like, yeah, and then, like, gummies. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So, it, but they, but they, they like, try and just, like, give him these, like, quick bursts. He'll, like, run backstage, like, grab it, pop it, boom, and he's back out. But this guy's jump. That's the equivalent of 10 hockey, because we work with the Tampa Bay Lightning, and we monitor them, so we know how, many, how much they have. 10 hockey practices, two and a half marathons. The guy's expending an insane amount of energy. 
So 99% of the population would be hospitalized with what this guy puts his body through. So our goal, one of the things that we're working with him on is obviously various different uh, strategies, metabolic strategies, to optimize. He doesn't, body composition isn't a thing for him, but to make, lower that inflammation and make sure that he can go on for another decade to really help effectively change, hopefully, a lot of people's lives. So here's some key takeaways. It's possible to gain muscle. Ketones have anabolic and anti-catabolic. We've, we've seen all these things. Um, the future's bright. And one of the things I want to talk about is what the future holds. I gave you a little insight of some of the research that we're doing, some of the areas that we're really trying to explore. And one of the things to understand is this. This community's very tight-knit, which is absolutely amazing. Um, there's, it really takes a movement. This took forever trying to paste all the speakers into here, but effectively, all of these speakers and everyone here is part of this movement. And there's so much going on in the ketogenic conversation that there's no need, like I see, I, sometimes I see it and it, it pains me because I'm like, guys, we're fighting an, an external force. We don't need to be fighting internally, right? You have like people that are extreme on like, this is how much protein you can have. This is how much you can't have. This is how much fat you need. Like the extremists, like why don't we work together and figure out solutions and say, hey, effectively as a community, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so one of the things that we do, so ketogenic.com is a resource that, uh, I effectively just started handling and taking over and purely don't, don't sell anything and purely is there to help raise awareness. Raise awareness for this conversation because I literally have a fe I fear that what happened to the Atkins conversation in the 90s can't happen again with the ketogenic conversation. Like where it had this boom and then crash, like it's, it can't happen. And so our goal at with ketogenic.com is to bring everyone in this community. It doesn't matter if you're a vegan keto or if you're a carnivore keto. Bring it together and understand that this conversation has so much power behind it that we need to effectively help tell that story and help communicate that to the masses because there's people out there that still don't hear about it. Uh, there's a girl in our lab who we just brought on who for 24 years had epilepsy and was on every single medication you can imagine, and a doctor never once mentioned that anything about a ketogenic diet. And it wasn't until she found an influencer on social media who she reached out to and changed her life, and now is completely off all of her medication. Like, there's so many more people out there like that, and it's really up to us to help effectively reach out, and the only way we can do that is by doing it together. So one of the things I want to show you is this, there's an entire campaign that we just started to put together. It's this what if campaign and everyone's ultimately a part of it. And I just wanted to kind of show you guys uh, what if we could sift through the noise and all of the stuff that's out in the market, all of the stuff that's out in the media right now, we could help come through and that's really what our goal is at ketogenic.com. What if I told you that dogs with cancer respond exceedingly well to a ketogenic diet? What if I told you that I lost nearly 150 pounds on a ketogenic diet. What if I told you you gained muscle mass on a ketogenic diet? What if I told you we were studying ketogenic interventions to help soldiers suffering from PTSD? What if I told you we were exploring ketogenic therapies for cancer patients? What if I told you I lost 25 pounds? The ketogenic diet has changed my life. It's changed my life. Changed my life. Changed my life. Changed my life. It's still gonna be on my vida. This has changed my life. What if there was a way to sift through all the noise? What if there was a resource that provided all the tools and information necessary to make a change? What if I told you we were here to help? What if I told you we are ketogenic.com? So effectively, that's our goal. And everyone in here is a part of that. Every, everyone is a part of that. And that's ultimately what we want to try and do. So first off, I want to thank our incredible team who who's went through crazy lengths to try and set everything up and helps provide content and information all, all the time on social media and articles and all that fun stuff. And especially these amazing individuals. Plus, Robin likes to say behind the scenes, but she's in here as well. So I appreciate you guys a ton. Thank you.